Hi, I'm Chris Stead, Finders Gaming Expert, and today we're going to be comparing the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. So what I'm going to focus on is what differentiates these two consoles. Now both of them have a reason for existing, they're not trying to be in the same space. They've both got different views of what the future of gaming is going to look like, and that's good news for consumers, it gives us choice. However, they do fundamentally offer different experiences that you will need to decide between. The PlayStation 5 is a console focused on the experience of playing video games. It's a console that wants to evolve the way that we play games, the way that games feel when we are actually enjoying them and sitting down and relaxing on our couch. Whereas the Xbox Series X is more focused on the idea of gaming as a service moving to the future. It's more designed as a box that's going to allow us to access more games at a cheaper price. Now, you can probably get a pretty good idea of the different philosophies of the two consoles simply by looking at them, whereas the Xbox Series X is just basically a more condensed uh, version of the Xbox that we've seen before, and it's really a great design console. I really love this console. It sort of feel, it feels so heavy and powerful when you hold it in your hands. It's all class, whereas the PlayStation 5 has taken a much more experimental design. It's trying to go for something different. And I, for one, like to reward companies for trying to reach beyond uh, into unknown territory and to take us into new places. But for me, the design doesn't quite work. Uh, it's a little bit too awkward, it's a little bit too big. You can see here the size difference between the two consoles. And it doesn't really sit horizontally that well. It does sit horizontally. There is a plastic stand that goes with it that helps to hold it up despite the concave of the console. However, it's still just a bit of an awkward beast. Outside of that though, the two controllers are where the fun really begins. Now, like the two consoles, the controllers are also in the same vein. The Xbox Series X controller is iterative. The DualSense controller for the PlayStation 5 is an evolution in how we play games. Now, when you're holding this in your hands, there's not too much to differentiate this from the Xbox One controller you've probably held in your hands before. It's a little bit thinner, a little bit more, less curved, a little easier to hold in your hands, a bit more textured, latency has been improved, which is probably its biggest selling point, but really, there's another massive leap to the point where you can pick up an Xbox One controller, sync that up with the machine, and just keep playing like you are playing the last generation. Okay, with the DualSense, however, it's a totally different experience. In fact, this is Sony taking a big risk here, ditching DualShock uh, design, which we've seen now for the best part of two decades. The DualSense is a whole different beast. Inside of this is technology we haven't seen before that changes the way we play games. The adaptive triggers, when you pull them back, you get strain on them, tension, depending on what you're doing in the game. The haptic feedback, is, which is kind of like an evolution of force feedback beyond rumble, is actually really uh, specific. You can feel it vibrating the whole way across the controller as you play. And when you try this with the uh, test demo game that comes built in with the PlayStation 5 Astro's Playroom, it blows you away. Okay, it's really fantastic. Of course, what we don't know is whether or not developers will continue to use this controller in innovative and meaningful ways as we go forward through the generation. So far at launch, I do have some concerns. Where Astro's Playroom is a dynamic game that really shows off this controller, the big blockbuster release of the launch is Spider-Man Miles Morales, and that is a much more generic uh, experience with the controller. Yes, it vibrates in the cool ways, in different ways, but you know, you're swinging through the town as Spider-Man, and that thing isn't getting tighter as that uh, web starts to tension as you swing between the buildings. And that, for example, would be a classic and easy way to use this feature. It hasn't been implemented. So that is a bit of a risk with the dual sense, but still got to give the points here to Sony for going big, going different, going hard, with something that really changes the way we can play games in the future. Yet again, the philosophies behind the two consoles also come down to the user interface. The Xbox Series X doesn't really uh, do much to its user interface you would have seen on the Xbox One, especially if you've updated to the latest UI in the last couple of months before release. It's effectively exactly the same UI. It doesn't really try anything brand new. Yes, it moves a little bit quicker. Yes, you don't have to wait for ages to get between the store and the game menu. And there's some small tweaks here and there, but nothing that's gonna blow you away. On the PlayStation 5, on the other hand, they've completely rebuilt the UI from the ground up and it feels futuristic. There's features in this UI we haven't seen before, including the ability to do picture-in-picture -picture mode where you can watch one of your friends streaming their video game while you're playing your video game, or watch a helps and tips video in picture-in-picture -picture mode while you're playing the video game to help you through it in real time. Uh, you can access your, the store, community content, uh, DLC, everything like that from the one game hub page. You can jump straight into certain sections of the game through the PlayStation Activities concept, where you can literally just kind of go, oh, I want to do this achievement and just jump straight into that part of the game, or I want to do this level, this mode in multiplayer and jump straight there. 
heaps of features like that really do push the user experience forward from what we've experienced in video games before only on the PlayStation 5. On the Xbox Series X, it's just iterative. Now you may be wondering why I haven't compared the power of these two machines yet, and I think it because at this point, it's something of a moot point. Technically, on paper, the Xbox Series X is the more powerful machine, by about two teraflops, or just under anyway. Uh, now, but the Sony team, they're arguing that those extra teraflops don't even matter because the hard drive, the storage hard drive in the PlayStation 5 has about twice, a bit less than twice the read speed of what is in the internal hard drive space, or the total hard drive SSD in the Xbox Series X. Sony argues that despite the fact it's got less teraflops, it can load game worlds quicker, it can bring more assets into the video game at a faster rate and therefore do bigger worlds than the Xbox Series X can do even with the extra teraflops of power. Microsoft, on the other hand, argues that it's Xbox Velocity architecture, software that's built into the machine to help the hardware, negates the fact that its hard drive is slower. So who are you going to believe? At this point in time, we really can't tell because all I've really got to test it on is a whole bunch of multi-format games which haven't really been optimised for either machine, they're cross-generation. Well, let's get to see in a couple of years down the track when we start seeing purpose-built games built for both of these machines to see really whether or not one can stretch its legs further than the other. I suspect they're going to be pretty even the whole way through the generation. Now, a console is only as good as its games, and when it comes to launch lineups, I'm going to have to grant the win here to the PlayStation 5. It does have more exclusives in its launch lineup, and there's, they're varied games as well. They're not all the same kind of experience. There's kids' games you can play co op with Sackboy, a big adventure with your children. They've got, uh, you know, big hardcore games like Demon's Souls Remake that you can really challenge yourself as a mature gamer. You've got uh, Spider-Man, which is family-friendly entertainment for everybody. There's a big variety there. There's Astro's Playroom built in as well. There's the Pathless, kind of a cool indie style game as well. And there's plenty coming ahead in the future. We've got Ratchet and Clank, Gran Turismo, God of War, Horizon sequel, all to look forward to in 2021. The Xbox Series X, on the other hand, has rather anemic launch lineup. You're looking at Yakuza as an exclusive, probably the best of the exclusives, and that's kind of a niche game, really. You could GTA, if you like your GTAs, you might like it, but it's still really not that hardcore, big blockbuster like Spider-Man is. You've got the Falconeer, Tetris, a few other little games like that. But really, when Halo Infinite slipped off the launch lineup, the Xbox Series X lost its launch pizzazz. That was its big game, and that's not there any longer. Uh, Yes, the Xbox Series X does have a good future ahead of it. We've heard about Fable 4, we've heard about Motorsport and Motorsport 8, we know about Avowed, we know about Everwild, there's plenty still coming in the future for this console. But a lot of the development movement on Microsoft's side has happened in the last year or so where it's snapped up a lot of developers, including Bethesda, the big one. And we're not going to start seeing those developers really turn around games exclusive to this format, probably until 2022. So we're not going to really see this console come into its own in terms of exclusives, like we are going to see the PlayStation come into its own with exclusives over the next year or so in the first year of release anyway. However, uh, in the launch lineup right now, as we stand, I have to give the lineup uh, win to the PlayStation. But, and there's a big but here, you may be thinking at this point that I'm all for the Sony PlayStation, judging by what I've said so far. And look, I am impressed by this machine. I do get really excited about the potential future for video gaming this console represents. However, what the Xbox represents for a console future is probably, potentially anyway, at least a smarter option and a more viable moving forward. And that's around subscription-based gaming and the Game Pass Ultimate service, which is extremely great value for money. This box almost becomes the best possible conduit to accessing that pass. That pass offers you not just online play, heaps of deals and discounts, and xCloud, which will be launching in Australia in early 2021, but it offers a huge Game Pass library, over 150 titles, including all the first party blockbusters, heaps of the big third party games, big range of indies as well, and backwards compatible games that you just get to access for free for a monthly fee. It's around the price of a mid-tier Netflix subscription. This could be the future of gaming uh, more so than what we're seeing with the PlayStation. It could be just ease of access, this cheaper way of playing games where you can suddenly play 150 games for you know 10 to 20 bucks a month. And that is not what you're gonna get on the PlayStation, at least in the foreseeable future. And this is where the Xbox really starts to give itself a opportunity or a selling point uh, against what the PlayStation delivers in terms of like more cutting edge and more advanced technology, more advanced ways of playing games, is it allows you to play games at a cheaper rate. This extends to the internal hard drive space. Now, both consoles don't come with all the hard drive space and it's a big major concern, but the PlayStation comes with about 150, I think it is, gigabytes less space 
off the go. That's about two or three or maybe even four games, depending on what games you buy, less internal hard drive space. And if you're not playing these games off their internal hard drives, if you're playing off externals, you don't get the next gen features. So what's the point, right? You need to play them off the internal hard drives and you're gonna to have to upgrade your internal hard drive on this one a lot quicker than you are on this one. And they're gonna cost, this is gonna cost you, they're both gonna cost you around 350 to 400 bucks to upgrade in Australian dollars. Uh, you're just gonna to have to get here a lot quicker with this one. Uh, and that, I believe, is a bit of a downer on the PlayStation. Now, I'd be remiss not to mention this little guy, it's the Xbox Series S. Yes, it's the uh, lesser tier of the two next generation Xbox consoles. There is another version of the PlayStation 5 as well. It looks exactly like this, except it doesn't have a disk drive. Now, uh, you could look at these cheaper options if you're trying to get into the next generation gaming and you don't have the expenses for the, or the funds to get the big ones. Uh, now, the Xbox Series S, I'm, I'm finding it a hard console to recommend. It's got a lot less power than the Xbox Series X and a lot less power than the PlayStation 5. More than, uh, less than half the power. Uh, it still can play uh, the latest games, uh, but you do cop a huge resolution hit down to about 1440p. Uh, so that they can keep the frame rate up, which is what they're focused on. But also, they said that the, when they first announced the Xbox Series S that there wouldn't be a problem with things like ray tracing and next-gen flourishes like that, HDR. However, we're also already starting to see some multi-format games saying that you won't get things like ray tracing if you play the game on the Xbox Series S. It also comes with only about 330 gigabytes of available um, hard drive space out of the box, which is hardly going to hold you more than, geez, five or six games maximum. In fact, if you get Call of Duty, that's two, that can be up to 200 gigs straight off the bat. That and Fortnite, you're done. So, uh, the Xbox Series S, I'm finding hard to uh, justify for anybody unless you're playing on real old TV that's just not going to see any great frame rates at all, or you see yourself using xCloud almost exclusively in the future, in which case hard drive space and internal power doesn't matter anyway, because xCloud streams games from the server and all the computing is on the server, not locally. The PlayStation 5, on the other hand, the digital edition, all you lose is the Blu-ray drive, and the Blu-ray drive is only really good for you if you're still watching movies on, Blu on Blu-ray or DVD, listening to music on CD, or if you want to play backwards compatible PS4 games where you have the disc, uh, not the download code. Uh, if you have moved on to streaming platforms such as Netflix and Spotify and so forth, then you probably don't need the Blu-ray drive, and you can take a $150 saving, that's in AU dollars, uh, obviously different depending on where you are in the world, and you get exactly the same amount of power. Therefore, in Australia, there's a $100 difference between the Xbox Series S and the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition, but you're getting the full power experience here with the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition, but here, you're getting a much lesser machine, and I find that hard to justify. There is one caveat to the Xbox Series S that I do have to mention. If you are a family, if you are a parent looking to buy one of the next generation consoles for your children, then this suddenly becomes a more interesting option. Not only is it cheaper to get in, uh, and it'll still play with the Xbox One controller as well, so it's a lot cheaper option, but the Game Pass and the ability to have a library of games are actually far more cost effective. You won't have to be buying that many games for your children to play, and the buying isn't that big, and are your kids really noticing the, the super fast frame rates and the, uh, the crazy resolutions and all that stuff? Probably not. So, which one should you buy? The PlayStation 5 or the Xbox Series X? Look, if you're really invested in the idea of experiencing the future of video gaming and where video game may head over the next seven years, then the PlayStation 5 is the way to go. If money's no object, the PlayStation 5 is the way to go. It does look like the console that's going to deliver the more unique, more advanced experience of actually playing video games over the next seven years of this console generation. However, if money is a bit of an object, or Things like the gimmicky, I guess you could call it a bit of a gimmicky feel of a DualSense controller and a UI, it doesn't really phase you. And the Xbox Series X does offer a very compelling option. It's way cheaper to get into. It's way better suited for backwards compatibility. And the Game Pass uh, library is just so impossible to beat at the moment uh, that it makes it that much cheaper to play long term. Of course, PlayStation does have some aces up its sleeve still to go. PlayStation VR will get a second release, probably 2022 or beyond from what I've heard and it can also come up with its own Game Pass service and at that point it'll become the absolute dominant console of the generation because Xbox will be struggling then to compete with the new experience that the PlayStation 5 offers. But right now, geez, it's close. Of course, there's plenty I haven't talked about in this short video. I encourage you to jump onto the finder.com.au website where you'll find full reviews of both the consoles, including full video reviews of both the consoles, which are also available on YouTube. 
And if you look at those, you'll find out heaps more about what differentiates these consoles and makes one great, the other great, and what makes them not so great. The good news is, is that both consoles offer a very exciting vision for the future of gaming, and I, for one, can't wait to get amongst it.